Um, we're just going to take a, a minute to make the transition to our next session. Um, but actually, I'll, I just want to say a few words, uh, again, just to scene set. Um, and, and interestingly, we, 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 we now stay in the same, uh, the same geographic location, um, but we're time traveling a few decades forward um, into a, a period which um, we're going to be looking at uh, during the art, Global Art Forum a number of times, um, what we call the short, what we call the short 70s, and this is a, um, this is very much uh, a kind of paraphrase of uh, of something that Eric Hobsbawm, who you saw earlier, um, talked about in a number of his books. Eric Hobsbawm fam uh, wrote a very famous trilogy uh, about the long 19th century. Um, which he claimed started um, with the age of, uh, of revolution in the, in the late 19th century uh, and went all the way until 1914. And then he wrote a really extraordinary book in uh, that came out in 1994, which is where that interview came from, uh, called The Age of Extremes. Uh, and the subtitle of that book was the, 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 the short 20th century, 1914 to 1991. Uh, and so I think that, that this, is, this is a very interesting concept that, uh, that we may use certain words to define units of time, but those actual units of time may be longer or shorter than the word that denotes it, right? So we wanted to put forward uh, the notion that one of the, uh, one of the perhaps uh, one of the last very significant um, decades, or in this case, short decade, for, for the current moment, for where we are now in the beginning of the 21st century, uh, is this notion of the, uh, of the short 70s. And this starts for us from 1971 and goes to 1979. And, and as I say, we're looking at this a, a, a number of times. Uh, in Doha, we, we, we looked at a period that overlapped. Uh, it was very, very close. Uh, it was from 1972 to 1982. Um, and, uh, and here we're looking at 71 to 79, and we're going to look at this period again tomorrow um, uh, in a more kind of global sense. Um, and we'll be doing that Oscar Gorriolo Rivera, uh, Marina Fokidis, and Terra Zolghadar. And uh, but for now we're going to we're going to be looking we're going to as I say staying in the UAE um, with a number uh, with a number of with a number of guests. So of course um, just to just to clarify this, uh, the UAE was founded in December 1971, uh, only a few years after uh, oil reserves were discovered uh, here. Of course, a slight difference between Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Um, so you, we had this period of nation building and also um, urban building, architectural building, civic building that happening at the same time. Modern architecture, though, on a, though seemingly on a wane in the West, found itself active in the UAE uh, and soon became manifest as municipal, domestic and corporate projects. So the spirit of a new f future was crystallized in the opening of Dubai's Jabal Ali port and World Trade Center in 1979. So this is one of these hinge points. However, in the accelerated time landscape of the Gulf, this period often lacks national affection and is slowly being erased. We wanted to explore and ask the question why this is the case and whether the period 1971 to 79 was actually more innovative and more interesting than certain kinds of history lead us to now believe. So I'm, I'm just going to briefly introduce our, uh, our, our participants. Um, we have two, two hosts and two guests. It's a kind of a double, uh, a sort of two-for-one uh, session here. Um, our two hosts are, are on stage now, Todd, uh, Todd Rice. Todd is an architect, a researcher, and writer currently focusing on the cities of the Gulf region from historical and contemporary perspectives. He's the editor of Almanac 2, The Gulf Continued, which analyzes the recent developments of cities in the Gulf, and he teaches urban study courses at Yale University School of Architecture. Uh, our second interview will be Adina Hempel. She's an architect and assistant professor 
professor at Zaid University's College of Arts and Creative Enterprises in Dubai. She was appointed as head of research for the National Pavilion of the UAE at the Venice Architecture Biennial 2014. Nadina received her MArc from Dresden University of Technology. Uh, our first uh, guest, so for us it was very, very important to get pr protagonists from this from this period, uh, it's led us on very interesting, uh, interesting uh, kind of uh, chases and uh, tips and so on and so forth. And we're so we're incredibly grateful to to the, to the two guests, the, the two protagonists from this period. Uh, first, I'd like to mention Anastasia Emanuel. He's an architect and town planner offering independent consultancy for international projects from Athens and London. He lived and worked for over 20 years in the UAE, having been chief town planner of Dubai municipality and founding member of Abu Dhabi Tourism Authority's development initiatives, including Sadiat Island and its cultural district. And last by no means least, um, gives us great pleasure to welcome Salem Al Musa. Uh, he's the founder and president of Al Musa Enterprises. Um, we will, through, this, through the next hour or so, learn more about his significant contributions to the making of Dubai in the, in the 1970s. And this is something that continues in his immense project, um, Falcon City of Wonders. Uh, I'm carrying one of the passports to, uh, to the Falcon City of Wonders. Um, and I urge you to look this up, but I know that by, uh, we'll be discovering more about this project later on in the session. Um, and, and I think Actually, Falcon City of Wonders uh, is, is, a, is a really uh, interesting uh, and important project that says much about uh, the relationship between the past and present and the future today. Um, and lastly, I want to thank Mr. Salem. He's been very generous to the Global Art Forum, and we're deeply grateful to, to his presence and indeed to all of our guests. So I'm going to now hand over to Todd Rice. So please join in welcoming our guests. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Schumann. Uh, we're, we're quite excited about uh, this, this, this short hour on a short decade. Um, we're actually going to start a little bit before 1970. Uh, 1969, uh, to be pre precise, is when this image is from. This is the launching of an al Khazan uh, from the shore of Dubai, uh, a couple years after the discovery that there was actually a commercial, commercial amount of oil in Dubai, not actually on shore, but beneath the Gulf waters within Dubai's territory. Um, the man in the middle is uh, a man from a company called Chicago Bridge and Iron Company out of Chicago, Illinois in the US. And the man to his, uh, to his right, the man who's his back to us is perhaps the most important man in the picture, uh, Sheikh Rashid. Um, this is a picture taken uh, when these, these kind of monsters of technologies were being launched from the shore of Dubai uh, to essentially be able to store oil as, as it was being extracted. So suddenly the oil that was so important for Dubai's development up till then, the expectation of finding the oil, was actually going to happen away uh, from Dubai, uh, become a kind of abstraction uh, in a way that oil would not be the element that would actually drive Dubai's ambitions and potential uh, but actually what Salem and we were discussing, the management would, would be that. Essentially, it's ability to move uh, within and without borders. This happened on a beach that became known because of this thing. It, it was called Chicago Beach. Chicago, this is what it looked like as these things were leaving, uh, leaving the shore of Dubai to go collect the oil. This is a picture of the Khazans being taken out with the ships. Uh, prom prominent people from Dubai uh, were on these ships to, as a kind of the ritual of taking these things offshore so that now Dubai could focus on land as, let's say, a place of development. This is the Chicago Beach Hotel or resort that actually 
kept the name of Chicago and became one of the, uh, began construction in the early, late 70s, but certainly became an element of Dubai in the, in the 1980s. Uh, just a little bit further, uh, this, is, this was the edge of, this is beyond the edge of Dubai at the time. Um, and even further out was the Chicago Beach Villas. Uh, Tassos swam in the swimming pool, uh, which is next to Adina. Uh, these villas were eventually demolished, and you're sitting where the Chicago uh, villas once stood, and here in Medina Jamira. I think this is an important m point to make because it's often seen as Dubai is this crazy place of tabula rasa, but it indeed has these, these levels of, of, of history. Uh, so not only was this a place where, you know, these these elements of oil were, were taken out. It was also a place of a resort that is no longer. It's been replaced by the Medina Jumeirah, by Burj Al Arab, by Jumeirah Beach Hotel. So nevertheless, we have um, these elements of, of the 1970s that are already kind of disappearing. Uh, and maybe to refer to what Ali Yunus described as these transformational points. I think the 1970s, each year was a trans transformational point. It was just continuous motion, uh, that even if there might have been a lot of matter coming in, a lot of things being built, maybe it wasn't necessarily being built to stay around for a long time. It was kind of perhaps something that was you being used to project even forward and forward and more forward. Uh, so we're going to start in 1970. In 1979, it's going to seem like an entirely different, different world. Uh, National Bank of Dubai opens in 19... Uh, 69, this picture is from 1970. This, as Tassos was saying, uh, was Dubai Creek. Creek is to your left. The old Dao culture, which uh, Buthena and Frako Herd Bay were all talking about, is located here. Um, this is kind of the, the new road. Uh, what was seeming to be new Dubai on the creek was quickly going to be supplanted by a new Dubai that was happening miles away from perhaps what, what planners, what people reporting on Dubai, we're seeing as the actual Dubai was quickly being kind of supplanted by uh, something new. Sheikh Rashid Ho uh, Hospital opens in 1970. It's not only an element of kind of Dubai's representation of itself as a kind of modern place where one can literally be healthy, but it was also seen as a place of being able to respond very quickly to needs. This is modernism happening quickly, this is two and a half years to build a state-of-the-art international standards hospital uh, for Dubai. It was also, uh, the architect was John Harris, uh, who developed these, these arches that became a, a kind of a symbol, an icon for Dubai, uh, used actually by the Department of Health as a symbol uh, uh, for, for their ambitions. Uh, I'm just giving quick ideas of where we were in 1971. This is uh, Costain, the British engineers who developed the, the, the redeveloped um, airport. Uh, we do have better images, but I didn't put them in <coughs> the correct space. But I thought, um, and this is maybe in memoriam to a, a great man, uh, a Scott, uh, who uh, was Sheikh Rashid's financier, also the general inspector of ports of Dubai. And he, kept a, he gave an annual report every year of the status of, of Dubai's finances. And this is what he wrote about 1972 and 1973. One might say Dubai has returned to its normal, abnormal growth rate, 40% increase by value in imports between 72 and 71. So I think we're already in a very kind of uh, era of ambition, of excitement, um, of, of being able to kind of be released from, trying to find a way of being released from certain constraints. Um, this is the 19, cover of the 1971 master plan uh, by John Harris, Dubai's second master plan. So this is one coming 11 years after the first one. And perhaps in our discussion, we'll, we'll get into a bit of what it, uh, it symbolized, but I think one gesture we should all understand is if this is the creek, uh, which we all know as being the kind of center of old Dubai, um, that development and ambition started to go down the coast toward the south, 
uh, toward what would be Chicago Beach Hotel, eventually all the way 35 kilometers down toward part Jebel Ali. And I think uh, it's this kind of ambition, this kind of uh, instability through kind of uh, kind of a, almost an obsession with with growth and and potential that we want to open it up and um, Salam I almosa uh, I wanted to begin with you actually um, because it's actually at this moment and I, I believe you you went away to study you went to the the US studied uh, in in Tampa Florida that's right um, and came back in 1974. 74, in the middle of the action. In the middle, exactly, in the middle of this abnormal, normal, or normal, abnormal action. And I, I guess I would just be curious what it was like uh, to be coming back as, a, as a, a graduated student, having studied economics, and this is your home. You've been away for a couple of years, and... And I lived there before. And you, sorry? I lived there before I left the United States. Exactly. Yes. So. What, did you recognize the place? Did you jump in? What was the well, your reaction? Well, let me tell you, I mean, you know, after the um, historian lady spoke about, about how the pearl divers and uh, how the people were poor and, you know, nobody looked after them. And, uh, of course, we were under the protection of the British. So we were under the protection of the British Empire. And we had great uh, deal with India and, uh, in terms of business and economics. At the same time, um, there were a lot of uh, worldwide uh, wars taking place and were affecting us very badly. And uh, the British, uh, they've occupied us for more than 150 years. And as far as, I'm, uh, as far as I know, the education came from Kuwait. The Kuwaiti government started building schools in Dubai. And you know, I'm just giving you a brief, a little bit of what happened in the past. And then, uh, of course, the uh, Sheikh Rashid uh, supported them. And of course, we didn't have income that will flourish the, the city. And we need any aid from anywhere. Because when British left us, we had nothing really. Even water to drink, we didn't have water to drink, we didn't have electricity, we didn't have education, we didn't have hospitals, we didn't have complete, we didn't have anything. And little by little, we had uh, from Kuwait, because the Kuwaitis have oil before us, and they start sending their educational missions and they're sending their hospital. Uh, doctors and you know to, to to build small hospitals and so on and that was in the early 60s and I left Dubai in late 60s I went to the United States to go to school and when I came back uh, Sheikh Rashid as as a planner as a, a man responsible of, of such crippled nation or crippled city he started uh, planning for for the future he borrowed some money from Kuwait, and he developed the creek. While we were discussing the creek uh, just before we come in, that the creek has a very important role that facilitates the uh, mari maritime uh, trade into the city from Africa, from uh, North Gulf region, Iran, and Iraq at the same time, uh, very close with, with India. And that's why Bombay came into the picture, because it's the closest place uh, to us. And Sheikh Rashid started planning the, the uh, first on education, because that he probably felt that's the most important issue, is to develop the, the generation in Dubai and to educate those kids and to provide the uh, proper education, proper uh, medication, proper housing. So he started concentrating on two things. One is developing humans. Two, developing the infrastructure that serves the human. And I think that was a very good planning. I think he managed the city very well and he uh, put down the foundations and I think my colleague, he, he knows about, uh, about this being in the Dubai Municipality town planning. And uh, 
We had, when I came back, we had an airport. We had, we had a, a, a large port Rashid that the ships used to stand in the middle of the Gulf. And then there are certain boats go over there, take the, the cargo and bring it into the city. It was a very hectic job. So they decided to build a Rashid port. And then he decided to build, yes, and he decided to build the uh, Dubai airport. And Dubai airport started with no tarmac. It was just simply compacted uh, sabka, which uh, very hard limestone uh, service. We received then um, the DC-3, and we received uh, the, uh, the next generation of McDonnell Douglas, which is the Viscount. And after that, then, uh, he started developing the airport more and more. They laid the tarmac, and the first uh, aircraft came to Dubai. It's called British Overseas Corporation, uh, BOAC, British Overseas Airways Corporation, uh, with, a, with, a, with an aircraft called VC-10. Uh, I don't know who manufactured that, but I think maybe it's a British Air Aerospace. And uh, uh, then we, we didn't have sewerage. As I said, we didn't have telephone and so on. So he started to build the Dubai electricity. So he got, he got all the merchants in, in Dubai and said, let's form a public company called Dubai Electricity. And then at the end, turned out to be Diwa. And uh, he bridged the, the creek. So the ships, they can come in, load their cargo, and go and take some cargo. And this flourished, this management flourished the trade. And suddenly we see airplanes coming. Uh, his, his idea of opening the sky, so anybody who wants to come to Dubai, he's welcome. He started emphasizing building hotels, building schools, building housing. And there where the, the momentum start working in favor of Dubai. And Dubai had luxury life before the formation of United Arab Emirates. Uh, shall I continue or shall I stop there? Okay. Could maybe as Axos actually maybe something more personal is that possible? Do you remember when you came back? I mean, you you flew in. Yeah, I flew in. You, yes. Did you take a drive around to see what had changed since you'd been away? I was I was young and my brain was somewhere else. <laughs> really. <laughs> Fair enough. I couldn't. You know, I wanted to do so many things at one time. My brain was busy thinking about so many things and not concentrating on one thing. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, immediately, I realized that there are some banks. There are some buying and selling of land. And I start saying to myself, well, do something. And uh, one day, I met this Chinese guy. And he said, I am coming to Dubai to work. Because they told me there is some dredging work in here. And you have only one company that have a monopolistic ex exercise in the field, which is Costain which built the airport, built the Port Rashid, and, and I dock. said, okay, so what do you want me to do? Um, he said, can you tell the Sheikh that I would like to participate? So I took him to Sheikh Rashid. After all, Sheikh Rashid sent me to go for, for my education. I always be with him. I, always, I don't leave him a second. I always uh, go and sit with him. I mean, you know that. And of course, um, also, the director of the municipality, Mr. Kamal Hamza, used to be there all the time. And I took this gentleman to Sheikh Rashid, and I said, he wants to participate in the dredging of the creek. And I said, OK, um, uh, let him go to Sir William Halkro to evaluate him. See, the man was, was doing proper management. He said, let the, uh, Sir well, w William Halkro to evaluate him. And for one gentleman, his name is Neville Allen. He used to be the head of uh, Sir William Halkro in Dubai. He sent him to Singapore to check on this company and came up with the report within 15 days and said eligible to take the, uh, the, the, the contract and bid for the job. So well, uh, this happened, I said to the Chinese man, what are you going to give me now? <laughs> he said, you know, it's all, it's all open heart. I mean, there's, you know, uh, so he said, he said, I'll give you 5%. I said, good, thank you very much. So what do you want me to do? I said, he said, whenever I call you, you come. I said, fine, sure, no problem. And uh, we start making that relationship. So we start dredging the, the, the creek. 
and we kept on dredging the creek for about three years because it's a big, big dredging from Algarhood Bridge down to the uh, reservation where all the bird reservation there Sheikh Mohammed has kept. Yes. And uh, then I went to one bank uh, called BCCI. <laughs> yeah, you remember? <laughs> yeah, BCCI. It's a great bank, but I don't know. The management was lousy. <laughs> and uh, I say to him, look, if you give me two million, I'm going to buy a piece of land, and if I sell it, I'll give you half of it. And this man, he was very, you know, very happy. I, I cannot find somebody to come and say this to you. He gave me the two million. I bought the land. After two months, I sold it, and I got the money. I took, him, I took the money to him. I said, take your share. He said, no, 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 thank you very much. I was just trying you. I said, you pay to the bank whatever it is and give me the money because I would have kissed your hand to give the money back to me. And I said, well, this is your money. And I start, the, you know, I start doing my business. The first thing I've done is I saw that a lot of uh, building is taking place, so I thought contracting would be the right thing to do. So I started a contracting company. I even I remember that I drive my own shovel to level the land, and I drive my own crane to, to carry the steel over to the, to the building, and I stay till 12 o'clock at night. It was an enjoyment to me. I was very young. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a pioneering uh, company. Pioneer, that's right. I called it Pioneer. Do you know why? Because my laundry in America called Pioneer Laundry. So I thought... <laughs> So uh, this is the story of my beginning with Dubai. But I always sat with this man, Sheikh Rashid, the father of Sheikh Mohammed. I think this man is, is really unique. He didn't go to university, uh, you know. But I, I say to him, I said, look, your highness, they say that you have white elephants. And I don't know really what white elephants are. And, and they say that the trade center that you're building and the port Rajat that you're doing, that Dubai doesn't, cannot take such heavy projects and they might just take you to bankruptcy. He looked at me. He said, don't listen to people. It's only God who gives. We will continue. And believe me, just do whatever you want to do and believe in it and plan it. I say, oh my God. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's me, <laughs> you know, that's me, long hair, 1970, you know, and the, um, you know, music of, um, you know, uh, Iron Butterfly, <laughs> yeah, uh, music of uh, Led Zeppelin, huh? and uh, the Tambourine Man by uh, Johnny... Uh, 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 John Denver. And why I'm saying this, I'm not saying that this building is mine. You see, uh, John Harris, they were the consultant for this. Am I right, sir? Yes. Yes. Uh, I have a picture of him here. Yeah. Sorry, we're a little messy with our slides. Yeah, that's him. That's him. That's John Harris with Sheikh Rashid. Yeah. And uh, they're both. They're both builders. You cannot find builders in, in, in different parts of the Arab world. Few of them, honestly. Because Sheikh Rashid, Sheikh Zayed, the rest of the rulers in the Emirates, the Kuwaitis, the Saudis, they're builders. And when you go to different areas in the Arab world, they're demolishers. And this has made, made, made everybody sad. If you see a country that's demolished overnight, like what happened to Iraq, overnight being demolished in three days, three nights. And now Syria is demolished. Lebanon is under demolish. Palestine and Israel, they're under demolish. Believe it, take it from me. Egypt, they saved their neck. Libya is gone for the hassle of their lives for the next 50 years to come. There's no way to recover. If you are a builder, you just continue to think positive. Otherwise, 
negativeness will dominate your thoughts and you become useless. And those leaders who once upon a time they were telling us that they, they know everything, they turn out to be nothing but paper tigers. These, these are the people who built the country out of nothing. They pulled their people out of poverty and sickness and dark future for them, but they did whatever they have to do. And I've learned a lot from Sheikh Rashid. So that building, which I say this to it, is actually I have made with a British company when they came to Dubai a joint venture. I didn't have the money to, to, to give to the British, but I said to them, look, you capitalize for me 20% of the, of the company, and I will bring you orders. So I will be your, the person who's going to bring the order for you to, to increase your turnover. And they said, OK, fine, we're going to do that. So they came to Dubai. It's called, it's called Hunting Group in UK. We made Dubai International Reinforced Plastic called DIRP. And DIRP now, today, is one of the best companies that can do anything that you require, facade of the buildings, interiors, boats, uh, you name it. And I made the mold for the, for the panels that are being cladded over this building. And uh, the John Harris came to us and he said, can you do the molds? And we said, yes. So we made the molds in fiberglass and they put the concrete in it, let it to dry, they take it by the crane and, uh, and fix it there. So I have 30% involvement or 40% involvement in this building. And, and that was because of Sheikh Rashid. Um, I want to go um, maybe a step backwards. You've mentioned in, um, in your presentation, um, you, you refer to Sheikh Rashid as a planner and as a builder. And um, I want to bring in Tassos into the discussion as well. Um, you came, um, I believe, in 77 to the UAE, um, a time when um, we saw a photo before of um, building, for example, the Dubai Petroleum, um, when that just had opened, a time when, um, as we heard, the airport was functioning, there were already um, certain infrastructures laid out. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, from the perspective of a planner um, coming in um, from a foreign country to the UAE, joining an, um, the municipality on, um, with Kamal Hamza and having a strong visionary leader, such as Sheikh Rashid, um, who had obviously a vision for the, for, for the city of Dubai. What was that like? What was your expectation and your, ex and your work there? Well, I don't know what my expectation was. I remember that I arrived at 2 o'clock in the morning. My visa was not ready. I had to wait until 6 o'clock and then be taken to a floating hotel moored by the creek, the Flotel, there was another, that was the name, belonging to the deputy director of Dubai Municipality, moored across Dubai Municipality through vast expanse of land. That was the creek development, phase two, the creek corniche development, where the parkings and various amenities are nowadays. So we had to cross all this vast expansion. Dubai Municipality building was under construction and we were in some single story, two story rather, not very interesting accommodation at the back of it. Uh, what I realized at that time then was that uh, if, there are no, if the hotels were all fully booked and they had to bring in boats for people to sleep in, there was something happening here. And what I realized soon thereafter was that it was a period of consolidation because the big rush had taken place. We were at the end of a second generation of development. As uh, Salem said correctly, you had the Kuwaiti Hospital and then the Rashid Hospital had been built, then another one, the Dubai Hospital was underway. Port Rashid had already been built and it was a new expansion. Uh, dry dock was under construction. Uh, we didn't know anything about, of course, the Jebel Ali and other plants undercover. Uh, but there has been an array of studies and competitions 
before I came. One of them was about the development of the Deira Sea Corniche, that's the front from the mouth of the creek all the way to Hamriya port, a huge development come to think about it. There was uh, a study that had been completed about the central business district development by Canadians that proved that there was quite a bit of pressure mounting up on downtown Dubai and the pressures, congestion being witnessed had to be addressed. There were more other projects like the Union Public Square that's straight opposite Dubai municipality across uh, uh, Al Maktoum Road. So quite a bit of development and of course the day I came I realized that there was another international planning competition taking place and the terms of reference had to be issued about a big shopping center. That was one of the rapid decisions that were taken by Sheikh Rashid overnight. When Sharjah announced that we are going to have a shopping center by the creek, Sheikh yeah. Rashid said, I want a shopping center by the creek too. <laughs> now, and of course the question is you cannot invite international consultants just like that, but it went ahead and the consultants had to work during July and August and submit in September. Uh, the only difference is that instead of having a competition for a shopping center, I expanded the terms of reference to have a competition about the planning of the al Garhud area, the whole area surrounding it. Uh, not that it went very far because there were other commitments as it always happened. For example, you had all the car repair shops of Dubai concentrated in the Port Said area. So you could not just kick them out overnight. That's something the Sheikh Rashid would never ever do unless he had found an alternative for their accommodation. Of course, we also had other vested interests like the Dubai oil field supplies or McDermott's occupying prime real estate locations on the creek frontage that again had to be persuaded to live. So there was a lot that was happening and a lot that was not happening in the sense that Union Public Square was never built, Dera Sikornish was never developed, the development of the al Garhud area eventually took place with the Dera city center being exactly the location where the, the shopping center of 1977 would have been. I was involved with it in later years, some 20 years later, you know, for the same site. But what was very fascinating was that the plans were doing, the plans were not planning in the very conventional terms. They were trying to record and accommodate the changes that were happening. I had some 10, 12 persons staff you know, in the drawing room erasing with razor blades all the ink to accommodate the new designs. And in this process, I realized that there was a development planned on the Dubai Sharjah Road, past the road from leading to Al Kusses, where Al Mula Plaza was at least, and that development consisted of big towers that would go towards Sharjah because of with Al Mula Plaza being an anchor for that big development. It was one of the rapprochements with the ruler of Sharjah cases. When it did not go very far and then the border disputes started all over again, the instruction was erase the development from your town plans, hence the razor blade again, and shift it to the Dubai Abu Dhabi road. So starting at the trade center around about where the trade center was being built and until the next junction, the so-called defense roundabout at the time, that stretch of road took all the development that was planned for Sharjah and consists of the 
100 by 100 plot. plots, yes, and with a parking behind, all for 20-story buildings. There is a photograph you have of the Trade Center looking down the road. That's the one. And the one down there is the first Aldrostomani building. Yes. Yes. I lived at the last tower there for three years and... No, it's the, the one standing alone there. The, uh, yes. It's, I, I, no. I, lived there I think on it's the one uh, Toyota inter, building. Inter, inter, see the whole traffic that was... Abu Dhabi. Yes. We were just crossing the road, making U-turns, you know. There was no reservation or anything like that. So what I was expecting, I was expecting to be able to consolidate the things that have been happening because there was a, a very dramatic spread <coughs> to many directions. Uh, a building permit should be issued within one day. So somebody would come and submit the drawings and they'd have to go through all the levels of checking and get three signatures within one day. That was impossible. So I said, no, a building permit will take one week. There was, of course, an upheaval for that because how on earth could I come as a foreigner and start telling the locals who were building the plots, not expatriates, and how long would it take for them to build their own house or their development? And in general, planning was was looked at with suspicion. It was a restriction on their freedom and rights, especially in their own land. So that's at one level. At the level of Sheikh Rashid and the management, the family, uh, uh, Sheikh Rashid and the, the management ruling of the country, planning was an exercise of investigating the options, the alternatives, what could be done, where and why, finally for the ruler to decide what he's going to do himself. If I jump to 1985, when the first comprehensive master plan of Dubai was done, and the policy statements were submitted to ruler's office and Bill Duff, that you mentioned earlier, looked at them and he was asked, what do you think of these policy statements for the development of Dubai, so fair and dandy. But at the end of the day, the ruler is going to do what the ruler is going to do. So for me, this encapsulates the planning process in Dubai, but also the role of Sheikh Rashid, who was the master planner, as I had told you when we first met, the builder, as you call him, yeah. and the visionary. I, I, I think this is really important. Uh, that this on? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Both of you have brought up the importance of Sheikh Rashid uh, as the builder, as the actual master planner. Um, and nevertheless, you just said uh, that, uh, that Sheikh Rashid would do what he wanted to do no matter what the plan said. Nevertheless, you also gave us the story of Garhud, where there were already workshops, that there already was development, uh, economic development going on, and he wasn't just going to come in and do some kind of royal decree act, clear out, let me, let me place here my vision. He was, it was a much more complicated affair uh, than that. No, he, does, he does that only in an area w where he doesn't harm people. Uh -huh. So if you have, uh, for instance, uh, some open land and he wants to do some developments on it, then he will ask immediately, go ahead and but he will not. The, he he formed a compensation company um, committee that if your land is affected by the road, then he pays you whatever is the uh, evaluation of that uh, part. But he was concerned more, mainly about his future look of a future Dubai. For instance, if you look at this picture, next to that building there is a white tent. You know what's this white tent? This was the first exhibition in Dubai. That's the exhibition where you have Trade Center exhibition now. This is how we started. So all the exhibitors are inside that. You believe it or not, for three days or four days and so on. And the second year, they also included Portaloos. 
Yes. Because the first year they did not have. Yes. <laughs> and um, but uh, he he was he was very very much uh, a responsible man. At the same time, there's a, an interesting thing where he he was also the responsible one. So for instance, in the late 50s and the early 60s working with the British to develop a, a, a municipality. I think the municipality's early 60s. He, he was actually creating a, a, a system, a structure, that he would also then contest. You know, when right? Margaret Thatcher came to Dubai, uh -oh. and <laughs> she, she's known as the, uh, the Iron Lady, and she saw this Iron Man, <laughs> and she said, oh, uh, you must be glad to have Sheikh Rashid. She evaluated the man and looked at what he did, and she realized that, you know, she probably needed two or three or four Sheikh Rashid to take them back to UK <laughs> to be part of her team because he's a good builder. And um, you know, I think Sheikh Rashid works from his office, from his house, from his majlis and from his you know hunting ground which he goes to hatta. to 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 hatta you know in hatta in hatta uh, he said to me i want to i want you to to do me a house so we built porta cabins he said okay now the porta cabins we built it with ahmed bakr mm -hmm. because ahmed bakr was doing the road to hatta that go and uh, Oh, do we have time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And he said, to, he said to me, he said, he said, you know, we're going to build 12 dams. Can we do it in one month? <laughs> and, I, and I said to him, because I, I'm the first person in the Gulf brought ready mix concrete called Unimix. I, I, uh, it's a joint venture between me and Tilcon of UK. And we had 21 transmixers, you know, these big cars that they mix the concrete while they're going to the site and then pour it on the site. So he asked me, he said, can you supply concrete? I said, yes. Day and night we will supply. So he said, go ahead. So 10 cars going to Hatta, 10 cars coming from Hatta. We build those dams in one month. Because he wants, the, this season, it was, it was the, um, the, uh, the March, where, where we have these uh, storms, which. You know, one storm just came a week ago or two or three days ago. After we finished, God just filled all these 12 dams for us. I think Sky just asked, answered Sheikh Rashid for his will, his wish. His, his uh, what do you call it, um, his uh, uh, road map his mission statement. So God said, pour. And, and the whole thing was filled with water. Even the boys, they took their boats and water skiing in Hatta. It was amazing. You, you mentioned something, I think, very interesting. So you, you talked about how, um, obviously, the Majlis of Sheikh Rashid um, yeah. was a very important place. And I'm wondering, so on the one side, we have kind of the municipality and obviously the planning section. And on the other side, we have the Majlis, which is an almost very institutional place where decisions were made, where um, suggestions were made, where um, kind of the main, uh, main people that decided the development came together. It might be interesting maybe to hear from both of you um, in either of your um, role in, in the developing of Dubai, yeah. what importance did the much less uh, of Sheikh Rashid play for you, maybe for your own involvement in the development? Well, this is actually a lousy microphone. There was normally a majlis at five o'clock in the afternoon to deal with Dubai municipality issues. And we were all going there to take the maps, the plans, the drawings, or to discuss about issues. And there was the nine o'clock majlis that was open to the public. That's what I called the democracy of the desert, where everybody would go in the tent and bring his problem and his issue. 
somebody would go and ask for money, somebody would go and ask, from the citizens, I mean, to ask for land or to help him with an ailing parent or buy him a car, as I have heard, you know. And what is fascinating is that all of these things were open to everybody, and everybody could more or less listen and comment. And you would be called, or they would be called, to come and sit next to the ruler and convey their wish. So, in certain cases, you would have an even early morning majlis. That was for very urgent, very secretive issues, or late at night, for example, Jebelali town, that was another plan that was prepared in the 70s, about a new township 30 miles, 35 miles out of Dubai for 30,000 persons, self-contained. For, for the union? Well, you see, that was done by Pedro Thorpe Chapman Taylor, yes. a joint venture between Australian and British consultants, that was monitored for some time. We had created, on the instructions of Sheikh Rashid, you know, a representative of Halkor, a representative of the consultants, and me from town, from municipality, the monitoring what's going to happen. We did not know anything about the Jebel Ali port. We were wondering what the Jebel Ali township was for. He had then given Ahmed Bakker the plot for the, for the Jebel Ali Hotel, and in the process also got his guest villa down there. Uh, so, discussions about something undercover were taking place at different times, and not in the main list, but at the back. So, it was a very, very interesting experience because you had Sheikh Maktoum come, Sheikh Mohammed, Sheikh Hamdan, all the sheikhs interchanging and visitors and discussing the things there in the open. I don't know if... It well, the, the idea of the majlis is to hear everybody or to exchange thoughts. You know, if you have to do something, let's say if he wants to, you know, make a hospital, and he will say, people are saying they need a hospital, people saying, you know, this area, which area you think that the hospital should be, and so on. And, and then the people will have their input. One will say, well, it's in Jumeirah. One will say, well, uh, they have in Jumeirah this, they have in Jumeirah that. And then he conclude the desires. And then after he consulting with the people, then he carry on and do the, 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 the job. This is one. Two, I think it is for his training of his children. They're always with him. So uh, Sheikh Hamdan has been trained to look after him, after uh, the municipality. And uh, Sheikh Maktoum is to look after the land department with the registration of your land and your building and property and so on. And then Sheikh Mohammed is to do the police and have Armed everybody force. safe in their homes. Even if you leave your home uh, door open, it will not be, you know, so you can. Th this is what is required by them. A home to shelter you. Then a peace to keep you happy. And food to fill your stomach. Then you got the world. That is how it's been done in, in, in his image, in his, in his thoughts. He says, as long as we keep people happy. That's why Sheikh Muhammad today is asking everybody, every, everybody is happy? Are you happy? If you're not happy, tell me. So they've been learning from their father, I think, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the security of the, of, the, of the place is very important. And then he starts welcoming everybody from abroad. That, this happens when, uh, okay, give me just two minutes on this. This happened when they wanted to build United Arab Emirates. So they say, we are going to build something called United Arab Emirates. Hey, the world, listen to this. We are serious, and we are going to cooperate with our friends. And everybody from all over the world, they start saying, we'll go to Dubai. 
go to Abu Dhabi, go to Sharjah, go to Dubai. Why? There is something different than where you probably come from. In here, you have, you can develop yourself, you can help and benefit, you can raise your children in a in, in, in peaceful way, you can interact with other different people. We have today 200 and something nationalities, and there is no difference between you, me, her, everybody. So we are all sitting down here, listening to what we're going to do in the future and how we're going to progress and so on. We are in a country that offers whatever man can need, honestly. So we need people for our infra infrastructure. So these are the servant of infrastructure. We cannot touch them. So the workers on the, on the roads, the workers on the streets, the drivers, the people inside the hotels, the people inside the hospital, the people inside, the, we have to take care of them. We have to build the best uh, accommodation for our labor. We have to treat our laborers like humans, like us. So live and let live. At the same time, we have to worry about the education. We have to give everybody education. United Arab Emirates now has the most universities, whatever. You don't have to go to Japan to go to, uh, to, to go to, uh, to, for education. Or you can have your education here. Hospitalization, uh, doctors from everywhere. You have shopping center, you have, now we are living our golden time with everybody who wants to share with us the love of this country. And, 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 and I have a small film, and this is, you, you're all artists, maybe you're all having this thought. I am, I'm part of you, and, and you see what I've done for, for everybody, and I hope that, I, you know, I, I don't want to be rewarded for anything, this is just my, my hobby. Maybe before we um, go to that film, um, I think we ran a bit out of time. Um, I just wanted to um, maybe conclude a bit what, what you both said and what I think shows um, kind of the side of the development that we normally don't get to talk about very often. The 70s is about um, the buildings, um, the kind of landmarks that set out the tone um, of the development. But I think especially through your work, you have done, like you mentioned the dredging. You, um, we didn't talk about this, but I know from previous yes. con um, conversation, there was a lot of work done also on infrastructure, really setting out the infrastructure for this country. Then I think the development um, and the planning that Tassos, you mentioned, and I think what's a very unique situation um, probably in the UAE um, is the fact that you do have a town planning unit at the same time you have almost complementary to it you have a much less which operates um, in a similar way but um, I don't think there's something similar to that in Europe um, one thing that I want to go back to how um, Todd started is we're um, we're obviously sitting at a place where there is different layers of history, and I think um, that is only possible through the developments that happened in the 70s, through all the investments, as we heard, um, through, in a way, the beginning of kind of this open society that allowed people to come in and that allowed people, um, that attracted someone like Tassos to work for it, the town planning to set up the unit and structure it. And I think that um, really structured all the developments then for the coming years, for the 80s, and effectively even what we see today. So um, do you want to add anything, Todd? Um, I would then say thank you both very much. Um, thank you. And we are, um, we are actually showing a project that is really, um, if you want to say, it's kind of sprung Artistical. from the development, from I guess from your um, development and from the works that you had done when you came back after your education. Um, I don't know where the video will be shown. Okay. Okay. One day, a boy went into the desert with nothing but his precious falcon and his precious dreams. And as he released the falcon, the boy whispered, Only my dreams soar as high as you do. Falcon City of Wonders. Where the wonders of the world 
both modern and ancient, are recreated as everyday habitats. Residences, offices, leisure hubs. From the pyramids of Egypt, Great Wall of China and Hanging Gardens of Babylon to the Taj Arabia, Canals of Venice, Big Ben and Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Eiffel Tower, Old Dubai and Beirut. More than 41 million square feet of residential, commercial, leisure, educational and entertainment facilities designed around the theme of wonders. Shaped like the UAE's emblem, the Falcon, with its wings outspread. Situated along the Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Road, linking the seven emirates with easy access to air, road and rail links, complete with occupied villas in different styles, surrounded by landscaped greenery, children's playing area, shopping, medical and social amenities. The residential areas are situated along the Falcon's outstretched wings. These are the Western Residences South, with 366 villas ready and occupied. The Western Residences North, with 227 villas underway. The Western Community Centre, Hypermarket, Mosque, Nursery and Clinic are under construction. The design of the villas follows Asian, New World, Andalusia and Santa Fe styles, featuring two to five bedroom spaces. Similar villa residential areas are available for future development on the eastern wing. Another prime investment opportunity is the signature VIP villa development with private helipads located between the wings looking towards the Hanging Gardens of Babylon multi-use residential and commercial area. An opportunity to attract the cream of society. Great civilizations have always developed around cities. In Falcon City of Wonders, the world's greatest cities have found their place. Rome, Venice and London flank the west, while India, Beirut and Old Dubai complete the east. Each one of these city areas will house residential and commercial projects themed accordingly. The Taj Arabia is a development which comprises a luxury hotel, restaurants, cafes and entertainment facilities. At the center of all these cities is our piece de resistance, Paris, with its landmark Eiffel Tower and Falcon Elysee in the form of residences, commercial towers and entertainment hubs. The list of great cities would be incomplete without the Big Apple. New York will be recreated adjacent to Paris with its iconic... Hi, I'm a... Uh, with all, uh, regretfully, we can't show the whole video, but it is on the Falcon, um, Falcon uh, City, uh, Falcon, Falcon City of Wonders uh, website. So please do have a look. I'm going to have to wrap this up. Thank you so much to our two wonderful guests, Tassas Emmanuel, to Salam Al Musa. And a round of applause to, T to Adina and Todd. Thank you so much for setting this all up. Thank you.